Hey there, and welcome. I'm Anna Hartman, and this is Unreal Results, a podcast where I help you get better outcomes and gain the confidence that you can help anyone, even the most complex cases. Join me as I teach about the influence of the visceral organs and the nervous system on movement, pain, and injuries, all while shifting the paradigm of what whole body assessment and treatment really looks like. I'm glad you're here. Let's dive in. Hello, hello. Welcome back to another episode of the Unreal Results Podcast. Um, so to start it out, I apologize for this podcast publishing late. I thought I was going to have time to record it last week while I was with one of my athletes and just never had the time. And then was going to do it after I got home, but I had a busy couple of days. So I've been nonstop since I got home and not just like nonstop, but like long days. Um, so here we are on the morning. I normally publish it recording it anyways, but I definitely wanted to get it out this week because I promised you last week a part two of the episode. So if you haven't went and listened to the previous episode, um, about the shoulder. Um, I think the title of that episode is why the shoulder comes last. Definitely listen to that first. The second part of this is going to be a little bit of, okay, now you've, you've treated all the other things that are important and related drivers to the shoulder issue. Now, Let's dive into the shoulder a little bit more. Now, this is interesting because even if... So last week, you you might have learned that, for example, a common referral, visceral referral to the shoulder is the liver. So it might... My treatment might look like treatment to the liver to deal with shoulder stuff. However, it is important that I get an understanding of where someone is at at their shoulder before I treat the liver. This is important for multiple reasons. Number one, it's important for me as a clinician to understand how much of their shoulder pain or shoulder injury or shoulder movement dysfunction is being driven by this underlying visceral pattern. And then also it's important for the patient or the athlete or client to see the relationship too. Because if they're new to this, they're going to wonder why you're not starting at their shoulder. And so you need to, it's not enough for you, you to explain the anatomy to them and explain that this is just how it works. They need to see it and feel it for themselves in, in order to believe it. And then two, if you're a new clinician at this, you need to see it and prove it and feel it and prove it to yourself that there is the connection. You know, don't take my word for it. I never want people to take my word for it. I want you to see it and feel it in your own body or in your client's body. Repetitions of that is what makes you see these patterns, see these connections and believe them and not only believe them, but like deepen your knowledge of the anatomy of how it all connects because it does really come back to the anatomy in learning in learning the relationships right so um this is an important concept and this is why with my assessment I always make sure I'm still assessing the orthopedics and the movement components of things so what do I mean by that I will do an assessment on someone and I always start with the locator test assessment protocol, the LTAP. That helps me figure out where the body wants to start. So with the LTAP, that's going to identify, is there a liver thing going on? Is it a central nervous system pattern? Is it the stomach or is it the lung or whatever it may be? Even it might be the um, lower extremity, something going on in the lower extremity. Whatever that is, that first part of the evaluation is where the body wants me to start. It could possibly be a driver 
for their complaint. In this instance, their complaint is shoulder pain. So before I treat where the LTAP led me, I want to pause and finish my assessment using my orthopedic and movement dysfunction or movement um, evaluation skills. So now I'm looking, now my assessment's going to look very more um, standard. I'm going to look at, you know, if it's a shoulder thing, I'm going to look at rib cage mobility. I'm going to look at, you know, both ribs and thoracic spine and diaphragm. I'm going to look at trunk rotation. I'm going to look at trunk extension and trunk flexion. I'm going to look at the cervical spine ranges of motion. I'm going to look at the relationship between the scapula and the cervical spine. I'm going to look at the scapula thoracic motion globally in flexion and abduction. I'm going to look at glenohumeral joint, internal rotation, external rotation, adduction, abduction, flexion, um, humeral abduction, all of the different ranges of motion that the shoulder does. I'm going to also look at that in a relationship of how is the glenohumeral joint interacting or moving on the scapular thoracic joint. Then I'm also going to be looking at the clavicle. How does the clavicle move with these motions? What is the relationship between the clavicle and the scapula? What is the relation? What's going on at the sternoclavicular joint? What's going on at the AC joint? How free is the clavicle to rotate posteriorly and anteriorly or roll, like to have a posterior anterior roll? And then I'm also looking at where is the head of the humerus in the glenoid fossa? Is it sitting? Is it centrated? Is it sitting in the center? Is it anteriorly translated? Is it superiorly translated? You know, and maybe here I'm doing some um, special tests, like provocative pain special tests to determine, like, is there an underlying pathology somewhere within the glenohumeral joint? Somewhere, I don't know. I might also do um, uh, neural upper upper limb neuro dynamic testing to see if there's any adverse um, or different type of neural tension patterns, right? I'm also checking the radial pulses. This is going to be important in identifying if, if there's any neurovascular entrapment. So I'm still creating, I like to call it my laundry list of orthopedic things. I want to know, do they have full range of motion, normal mechanics, right? Good scapular humeral and scapular thoracic rhythm. Do they have good strength? I might be manual muscle testing them. And, um, you know, and this, this, all those things that I include on an assessment are going to be specific to the patient in front of me, to the sport they play, to what they're trying to get back to, what their complaint of pain or dysfunction is, you know, what our goals are, right? So I might even look at closed chain things or, um, whatever athletic motion they're doing. So once I have that orthopedic laundry list of things, this is where, you know, before I had the LTAP, before I had this um, general listening knowledge and evaluation from the visceral and neural manipulation work from the Baral Institute, I would get that laundry list of orthopedic things at the upper extremity, and then I would also do a thorough assessment of their lower extremity, hip mobility, ankle mobility, like rotational stability, lumbopelvic control. I would basically do a whole body assessment, right, especially when it comes to the shoulder because so often shoulder problems are driven by a, a poor kinetic linking. So I, I'd get the whole laundry list. So you can imagine when somebody, well, not imagine, you know, when someone comes to you with an upper extremity issue, you have a whole lot of things to work on. And then I would determine where to start by just my best clinical judgment and my bias on whatever sort of mode of thinking I was in at that time, right? So, um, 
maybe if it's a, a baseball player, I'm like, oh, I just really need to get their scapular thoracic joint in a better position. And so I'm starting with um, upward rotation type of stuff. Or maybe I'm like, they need some sort of internal rotation or, you know, so I'm, I'm basing where I start off of just the orthopedic laundry list of things that we need to change. And then my experience as a clinician with shoulders or whatever, um, mode of, um, clinical treatment setting I like, right? Like if I'm a big um, PRI person or DNS person, like maybe if I'm even starting with some sort of respiratory stuff, right? Breathing stuff. Or, um, if I'm Pilates, I'm, maybe I'm starting with segmental spine mobility, or maybe I'm a big like kinetic linking person. And I'm like, nah, forget their shoulder. I need to clear up their hip mobility first. So, um, but whatever it is in my mind, I'm thinking of like, man, they have like 25, 30 things on this orthopedic and movement laundry list, I have to plan out this whole rehabilitation program with manual therapy and mobility and strengthening and motor control. And I'm going to, I'm already like, man, I need this person to commit to like three or four times a week in order to do this and make these changes. Because I know that it takes a while to improve someone's scapular position right if someone's stuck in downward rotation then I you know it I'd say it used to take me like a good two weeks to get them out of that pattern and I'd even use like um scapular reposition taping with leuco tape and all the things I was successful I I helped people people felt better but it took a couple weeks and um multiple sessions so now, now I have this laundry list and then before treating on it, I go back to where the LTAP led and I treat that. So in this case, I treat the liver and then I'd reassess. Before I did any other treatment, I would reassess. I would reassess the LTAP and see where to go next. And then I would also reassess this orthopedic laundry list of things because this is the moment where you're going to see how many things changed in relationship to the driver from the liver. And it's usually a lot. It might take a laundry list of 20 things and bring it down to five things. I've just saved myself a ton of time. So um, that that's the, I wanted to give you a general idea of the, like a treatment session because I don't want you to think when I say never treat the shoulder first that I never touch the shoulder. If someone's coming in with a shoulder complaint, I make sure I touch the shoulder very soon in our assessment and get an idea of what's going on. Uh, it's just that I don't treat there first, but I'm always reassessing. So if somebody comes in for a shoulder thing, I might reassess their shoulder three times within one session before I actually do treatment on it. But every time... I'm eliminating a laundry list of things I thought I needed to take care of. So with that said, today's episode, I really want to talk about um, the upper extremity movement assessments. Uh, I'm not going to get to all of them because that would take forever. Um, but today I really wanted to talk about scapular thoracic mobility and um a little bit about glenohumeral joint, but mostly about scapular thoracic stuff. And a little bit too of just using this lens of view of the body that the organs are the most important part to the body, the most important thing to the body to actually allow us to take our traditional orthopedic stuff, right? Our leftover laundry list and treat it more intelligently, understanding the neurovascular anatomy. So, that's what we're doing. Also know that like all of this, these last, this last episode and this episode are a preview of what's to come in the Saturday uh, three hour live online event, Never Treat the Shoulder First. So Saturday, May 20th, it's coming up. So um, I hope you join me for that. But that that's what all of this is sort of prepping. 
All right. So I got my um, bone models for those of you watching on YouTube because I wanted to reiterate, like like I said, we're talking about scapular thoracic um, rhythm. So when we look at the scapula, normal position of the scapula on a thorax would be the vertebral border being parallel to the spine and um, about two and a half inches away from the spine. Two and a half to three inches is a normal amount of abduction of the scapula, right? So this is my thorax. The scapula is two and a half over here. That also means that there's a relative amount of um, internal rotation of the scapula as it lays on the curve of the rib cage. That's what brings the scapula in what's called the scapular plane, which um, is talked about a lot when we're looking at glenohumeral range of motion. The scapular plane is usually tilted about 20 degrees, 20 to 30 degrees, I think. Don't quote me on that. Um, but you could see too that it is also depends on the shape of someone's rib cage. So you need to pay attention to what that's like. Some people have pretty flat rib cages. That's going to change the relationship of the scapula and the scapular thoracic joint. So the other bit here is because of the curve of the scapula, when the scapula sits on the rib cage, it also sits in anterior tilt. I'll take a side view here. So that means the scapula is not vertical like this. It's slightly tilted forward about an inch, which is relatively about a 10 degree anterior tilt. So anterior tilt, slight internal rotation, slight abduction. That is a normal position of the scapula on the thorax. Now, if we're looking at the posterior border again, the superior angle is usually around the level of T2, and the inferior angle is usually around the level of T6-7, depending on the height of the scapula. Um, these are all things I look at because um, it's important, I think, looking at general postural positioning statically is as important and can give you as much information or more than movement can. So uh, one of the my favorite quotes that I used to use a lot when I talked about this when I taught it back in the day is, um, posture follows movement like a shadow. And it's a quote that I got originally from Chrissy Ruby, who is a teach a physical therapist that teaches in the Pilates role a lot, and it is a Sherrington quote. So Sherrington um, from the early 1900s, and he was like a physiologist, and so that is a quote from him actually. Um, Posture follows movement like a shadow, and um, that is. I'm gonna replace posture, and I'm gonna say dynamic alignment or alignment follows movement like a shadow. Um, and so it can tell us a lot. If you look at someone's scapular, scapula bone on their thorax and you see that it's really vertical or close to the spine or um, tilted, right? If it looks like the inferior angle is lower and, or sorry, the inferior angle is closer towards the axillary line and the superior angle is lower down than T2. That could be a downwardly rotated scapula. If you see the whole scapula and it's just lower than T2, that's a depressed scapula, right? So these can give me an idea of what I may find on a movement assessment, right? If someone is stuck in an alignment in downward rotation, Sorry, downward rotation, I named it opposite. So I told you the directions of upward rotation, which is a thing too. Often we see people stuck in a little bit of upward rotation to start. But if they're stuck in downward rotation, which is inferior angle, more medial, closer to the spine, then I could imagine, interesting, they have farther to go into full upward rotation of the arm during abduction and flexion. 
are they over, able to overcome it or do they kind of stay lacking upward rotation the whole time? Interesting enough, the opposite, upward rotation alignment problem, sometimes even though they're starting at upward rotation, they still don't get all the way of, into the full upward rotation. So it can it can be interesting to see how the alignment relates to the movement. But understanding those positions is important. And then just motion, right? So I we talked about anterior tilt. That's just the anterior tilt of the scapula. We've got internal external rotation. And then we've got depression and elevation. And then we have upward rotation and downward rotation. Upward rotation and downward rotation are the motions that we end up talking about a lot because that is what puts our arm overhead. Um, the, uh, and we're going to obviously come back to that. The other motions too are going to be a deduction and a abduction, which is in the scapula is known as retraction and protraction. So upward rotation is a combination or a force couple of multiple muscles and movements happening together. It's a combination of elevation from the upper trap, protraction from the serratus and interior, and then the lower trap, because it attaches to this top corner, this um, superior angle, when it contracts for a depressant depression, because the scapula is already in protraction and elevation, that little bit of lower trap creates a twist, what creates the rotation or the upward rotation of the scapula, right? Because upward rotation, the axis is actually happening at the um, AC joint, right? That's how the AC joint is part of it. But that's the force couple motion that creates upward rotation. So these combinations, classically in sports medicine, we've always looked to the muscles. So when we see someone with not very good upward rotation, we look to, is there a muscle weakness somewhere? And oftentimes, actually, what we see is the pretty good on the concentric phase of lifting your arm up, but then when you bring your arm back down, the eccentric phase of upward rotation which is moving into downward rotation, that tends to be where we see things fall apart a little bit. So that eccentric control, we know that eccentrically it requires more strength and control so and stability. So it kind of makes sense that we see that pattern. But we've always looked at it and blamed the muscles, specifically the muscles around the scapula. And... The interesting thing is, remember, the scapular thoracic joint, though we call it a joint, is not a joint at all. It is an interface between the scapula and the thorax, and it is controlled solely by this motor control, which we, we think, we thought, is the most important thing. Um, but what is often forgotten is that the motion is actually coming from the clavicle and the joints of the clavicle. So the sternoclavicular joint, which is the where the clavicle attaches to the sternum, that is the only bony articulation of the upper extremity to the um, axial, axial skeleton, right? So that is a, the main joint that moves our arm around is our sternoclavicular joint. And then also the AC joint, so the acromioclavicular joint. The acromioclavicular joint also helps this motion as well. The SC joint, the majority of the motion comes from the SC joint. So elevation, depression, adduction, abduction, or protraction, retraction, anterior tilt, posterior tilt, internal and external rotation, this is all actually coming from the SC joint. So with upward 
rotation and downward rotation, what happens is the SC joint helps to get in the, with the muscles. The SC joint helps to get our scapula in that elevated and protract position, right? So the SC joint inferior goes inferior and the SC joint goes posterior and that gets the arm up. Then the lower trap pulls down on the superior angle of the scapula and that pivots it at the AC joint to get the rest of upward rotation. That's why the axis of rotation, of upward rotation and downward rotation is the AC joint, but it's because of this um, unique relationship between the SC joint being like the primary strut of it all and then the AC joint like being what the scapula is hanging off of and because of it's kind of like a pinwheel right because of where the lower trap and the levator scapula attach to that inferior angle it either pulls it up into downward rotation or pulls it down into upward rotation Right? So hopefully that makes sense of how the AC joint is such an important piece of upward and downward rotation. But without the motion of elevation, depression, adduction, and abduction or retraction, protraction coming from the SC joint, you don't get it. Right. So the, the SC joint and the AC joint work together to allow those motions to happen. So remember... And we, I shared about this a little bit in the um, um, thoracic outlet syndrome podcast episode, which I'll also link. But remember, the relationship between the shoulder blade and the clavicle, it's a wide V. It's not on top of each other like we often see it in pictures it is more like a wide v right because the the scapula is in the back and the clavicle is in the front of the thorax so there's a lot of space in between that right but the clavicle positions right it moves and the scapula is at the mercy of that and so the scap the clavicle the sc joint is what's helping to place the scapula overhead so when oftentimes we had given an analogy originally of when it comes to the glenohumeral joint, the ball and socket of the joint, right? The glenoid fossa of the scapula and the humerus of the upper arm bone, we talked about in order to lift the arm up overhead that we needed the scapula to place, to lift the arm up overhead. And we used to use an analogy of the glenohumeral joint like it was a golf ball sitting on a tee, which you can see that, right? Or a ball sitting on a plate because the um, glenoid is a very, like, um, shallow bowl that it fits on. But that was a bad analogy because it made it seem like the scapula shouldn't move. And so then there's this analogy that I used to use, which I still use, is that the, the scapula is like a seal. And the humerus, the ball of the humerus, the ball of the um, glenohumeral joint, is like the ball that the seal is balancing on its nose. And the ball goes where the seal puts it, right? It's not like the um, ball is pulling the seal. And the seal can move. But think of it as the body of the seal is actually the clavicle. And then the glenoid fossa and the scapula is the head of the seal and the nose. And that is the fine tuning, like, you know, little bits. But even that fine tuning comes from the AC joint. Majority of the motion and the positioning comes from the SC joint. So by understanding this, that means we would have a di whole different approach to improving someone's scapular thoracic rhythm besides strengthening it or stretching it or scraping it or needling it or um, smashing it with massage balls, right? Because now we're not just looking at it as like these muscles. We're 
in this fine tuning motor control, which it still is. I'm not arguing with that. But we're taking a step back and being like, wait, in order for the muscles to work well, they need to actually rely on the joints moving too. And so many people have clavicles that don't move a whole lot at all. A lot of my athletes have had injuries to the AC joint, injuries to the clavicle itself, injuries to the SC joint, and never really, nobody ever really touched the clavicle after that. It was like, oh, you put, get put in this sling and then that's it. And so restoring rotation of the bone, motion at the scapula, at the SC joint, even um, motion around the SC, S, AC joint is so important. What's interesting too with the clavicle is the relationship of the joints between the AC joint, but also between the clavicle and the coracoid process and the clavicle and the um, front edge of the scapula itself. We've got ligament, we've got a lot of ligaments there. It's not just over the AC joint, but there's plenty of clavicular corcoclavicular ligaments that need to move in order for the clavicle to rotate because when the clavicle when the arm is moving the clavicle is moving like a lever but it's also twisting and this twist as well as elevation of the clavicle is usually what's missing so um just knowing that it's there to assess and it you don't have to it's not like a fa- fancy assessment. I literally just put my fingers on the S- SC joint and I notice the motion. So when the shoulder lifts up, the SC joint should sort of go down, right? It's like a teeter-totter. When the shoulder comes down, the SC joint should come up. When I retract, the SC joint should come forward. When I protract, it should come back. So if I don't feel it ever coming back, that's a problem. Um, when I, even when we have glenohumeral joint motion, because when the, when the glenohumeral joint goes through the motion, eventually that global motion, there is some anterior and posterior tilt that happens at the scapula. And so if it's happening at the scapula, it means it's also happening at the clavicle. And so when I'm going through full rotation, I want to feel the clavicle moving in those positions too. Of course, I still want some good, clean glenohumeral disassociated movement from the scapula, but eventually the scapula should move. Scapula should move because when the scapula moves, it saves the glenohumeral joint. Most people who have have pain in the glenohumeral joint, they have pain there because the glenohumeral joint is moving too much. And if we could just distribute the movement out and get the scapula to move more, their glenohumeral joint doesn't hurt anymore. I can't tell you how many baseball players' shoulders I've helped save because we just had to get their shoulder blade moving. And now they're clavicle moving. Sorry to my baseball players that I didn't appreciate the clavicle motion before because I feel like I could have helped a lot of them even more. So it doesn't have to be fancy to assess it. It's just notice what's happening in all of the positions. Is it moving or is it not? And then we take a step back of like, okay, so the SC joint, what muscles or what nerves relate to that joint? Because if that joint's stuck, we need to get it going. For So first, the first thing is the subclavius muscle that is a main main depressor of the clavicle and so if i'm telling you that we don't often see scapular elevation it means that the subclavius is often um, restricting it a little bit interesting enough the nerve that innervates the sc joint is also the nerve that innervates the subclavius so it makes sense that they go together the nerve to the subclavius comes off of the upper part of the brachial plexus. Upper part of the brachial plexus has a relationship to the phrenic nerve. This is the this is the reason why the visceral thing and the central nervous system piece is so big on shoulder health. 
because the primary joint of the shoulder is the SC joint. And so that joint is a very visceral joint. <sighs> the other thing that happens is we get obsessed with this posture of lifting our chest up, pulling our shoulder blades down and back, and we keep our SC joint sort of stuck anterior. When it's stuck anterior and it's stuck elevated, it has a really hard time going opposite, right? So freeing that up is so important. Um, the subclavius and the upper trap and the cervical fascia play a really big role in allowing the clavicle to rotate as well. So again, we're back at like a lot of cranial things, root of the tongue, hyoid bone. The hyoid bone not only is it a main attachment for some of our cervical fascia, but that cervical fascia that attaches the hyoid also is the same fascia that becomes our clavicular pectoral fascia, which is where our brachial plexus come through. So that can affect the whole upper extremity. Plus, there is a muscle, the omohyoid muscle, that goes from the hyoid bone to the scapula. It is one of the 17, 18 muscles that attach to the scapula. So there's a big connection there. Um, the other interesting thing about the SC joint, and of course, like, again, like I started with at the beginning of this podcast, there's so much that we could look at, right? This is why I'm doing a three-hour workshop on it because it's it's just, there's a lot. But the other cool thing about this sternoclavicular joint is that there is a um, fiber cartilage disc in it, which means that it's supposed to be weight-bearing, right? It's a weight-bearing joint, which makes sense since it's, it is a joint that is connecting our upper extremity to the rest of our body. However, how many times do you look at upper extremity weight bearing and you blame the issues on not being able to weight bear very well on the serratus anterior or the scapular thoracic stability or strength? Maybe it has nothing to do with that. Maybe it's all stemming from the sternoclavicular joint being jammed up, all right? We know that the thorax position, we haven't even really touched on that, but the thorax position is so important. We need a curve. We need a curve and a roundness of the rib cage for the scapula to live on. If you look at the scapula, it is curved. Curves live on curves. So constantly focusing on thoracic extension and opening your heart is the opposite of what we need for good scapular stability. Scapula and the thorax need to be in a constant embrace with each other to get the full stability out of it. That's why some of the exercises when I'm working on true upward rotation and scapular stability with mobility, I always do with thoracic flexion. It doesn't mean that you can't extend but it means that if I'm really trying to work on my stability, I should probably couple it with thoracic flexion. <sighs> Take a breath. So that gives you a little preview. I teased it, so I do want to touch on it. But when we're looking at a movement assessment too, and we'll go back. So let's say you freed up the SC joint. You freed up the clavicle to rotate, so AC joint's good too, right? Now you're like, okay, well, they still have a limit. They're still winging. Let's say we'll, we'll just use a classic. They're still winging. Their, their scapula is still winging, especially on the eccentric phase of upward rotation, so bringing their arm back down out of shoulder flexion. Okay, so that is like our traditional, quote-unquote, serratus anterior weakness. So before you go banging your head against the wall, doing a million serratus anterior punches or scap push-ups or whatever your favorite way to strength train the serratus anterior, kettlebell arm bar with rolling pattern, whatever it is, 
I've done all of them. They're they're great, but also they're only going to be effective if the message to that muscle is effective. So then you have to take a step back. Whenever I see a muscle that is tight, a muscle that is weak, or its pattern of when it's turning on, well, again, I hate that word turning on because they're always on. When it's being more active or less active, if those don't seem right to you, before you just force it to do what you want to do, take a step back and think about what nerve innervates that muscle, right? Now it's important to pull out your computer that's always in your hand, right? And Google it. You don't have to memorize all this stuff. Google it, have an anatomy book, buy whatever you want. But the serrated interior is innervated by the long thoracic nerve. So where's the long thoracic nerve? The long thoracic nerve is one of the supraclavicular branches of the brachial plexus. And so you would think, hmm, supraclavicular branch. So it's above the clavicle, but also it's going to the armpit. So it's going to go above and behind on its way to the axilla. Um, because there's another thing you can Google, where is the long thoracic nerve? And you're going to see that it comes down, but then it follows the rib cage and it actually ends up mid axillary line <clears throat> at the fingers of the serratus anterior. So you have now multiple spots that you can treat to change the input to change the tension around the nerves because oftentimes when we're not getting good neural input is because the nerve is getting compressed or over tensioned or just trapped somewhere it's not not easily able to freely glide and slide and do its thing so you might look at the levels of the cervical spine that it comes out of the long thoracic nerve, it comes off at the root level, early in the brachial plexus. It comes off of the nerve roots, C5, C6, and C7. So you might go and clear those segments. And then from there, it travels inferior, underneath the clavicle, along the thorax to that mid-axillary line. Okay, so understanding that route of the long thoracic nerve, now you know what spots that you need to direct treatment. So at those nerve root levels, C5, C6, C7, at the retroclavicular space, and then at the area that the branch, the ter- right, the end of that terminal branch comes a little bit more superficial, which is the axillary line of the rib cage there, again, where the fingers of the serratus um, anterior kind of interdigitate in there. That spot is often really tender on people. That is a common spot that I use the quarters ball or the Franklin ball and breathing to open up. It's a spot that when I'm doing dynamic cupping, things just kind of get stuck. It is a very common spot for the long thoracic nerve to get entrapped. And so you direct treatment at those three spots. Now, there's a way to figure out what spot it is um, to save you, but also it doesn't take that much time to treat all three spots. So then you treat all three spots and then you reassess the serratus anterior. So you do the single arm push up or you do the overhead motion. Do they still have winging? Most of the time, if not at all, freeing up the nerve eliminates that need to do strengthening exercises at nauseum without a huge result. Freeing up the nerve first and then doing the exercise makes it easier to do the exercise correctly to create a movement experience that the athlete actually remembers and then is repeatable and successful. When it's repeatable and successful, then you can do whatever exercise you want and you're going to get gains from it. 
it's when you're doing exercises over and over again that you're having to cue the shit out of that the athlete has to think to turn the muscle on, you've already lost the game. You're going to be, that is like being, if you ever floated down a river and you got caught in an eddy, that is you just spinning around in the eddy forever. So it's like you make life easier when you can appreciate that the muscles are kind of dumb. And I say that in the most loving way possible that maybe they're not dumb. They're just, they're actually, they're not dumb at all. They're smarter than you. They are not functioning for a reason. Not because they're weak. It's, it could be because they're weak if you work with spinal cord injury people, if you work with um, very deconditioned people, if you work with people after surgeries, after major injuries. Sure, there might be a little weakness, but most of the time, it's just that their messages to them are not that clear. Clear up the message, create a movement experience, and watch people get so much more out of the exercises you give them. So every muscle that you look at and you think is weak or not functioning well, take a step back, see what nerve innervates it, and then look to where that nerve comes off the brachial plexus and then what the common entrapment sites are. That's going to save you so much time. So here we are, 45 minutes in, and um, barely, barely, barely making progress in like this, the, the amount of deepening of the knowledge of anatomy can help you be more precise and specific with what you do and how you assess and the outcomes that you get. So that's it for now. Um, just because the shoulder um, three-hour live event is this weekend doesn't mean I'm going to stop talking about the shoulder. I'm sure I'll talk about it again. We barely test the surface of the brachial plexus. If you haven't been paying attention on Instagram, I've been talking about it a lot. So check out some of those posts. I'll link some things in the show notes. And holler at me if you have questions. And um, thanks for understanding that the pod's a little late. Have a great day.